gonna mug me. I'm not gonna mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the decent marathon. Download Veely now. At 42 million. The art world, where paintings change hands for fortunes. So, thank you very much. But for every known masterpiece, there may be another still waiting to be discovered. This is it. International art dealer Philip Mould and I have teamed up to hunt for lost works by great artists. We use old-fashioned detective work and state-of-the-art science to get to the truth. Science can enable us to see beyond the human eye. Ta -da! Oh, wow! Every case is packed with surprise and intrigue. Is it? Or isn't it a Freud, then? But not every painting is quite what it seems. It's a journey that can end in joy. This is definitely by Paul de la Roche. <laughs> <laughs> or bitter disappointment. I can't cope with this roller coaster. What a nightmare. In this episode, we're taking on one of the most important cases we've ever faced. Can we prove that this beautiful English landscape is a work of national importance? That's it. Yeah. There on the wall. A lost masterpiece by John Constable, and quite possibly an alternative view of his greatest work, the Haywain. I feel I've just walked into the most famous landscape painting of all time. It's a journey that takes us from Constable country to Los Angeles on the trail of a painting with a colorful past. I now know who owned your picture. Wow. You've got a name. But with Constable, the most forged artist of the 19th century, are the odds stacked against us? So two artists at work rather than one. That sounds like a problem. Every art dealer has a tale of a special picture that slipped through their fingers. An artwork so important, it should be hanging on the walls of a world-class gallery. So when I was a fledgling dealer in the mid-1990s, I bought a picture which I thought might well be a sleeper, uh, an overlooked work by one of the greatest landscape painters who ever lived, John Constable. Well, that certainly is one of the most famous names in British art history, that's for sure. But was it a bit of a long shot? Well, I'm afraid the experts thought so. Despite my best efforts, I failed to prove it. So I was obliged to just sell it on. And I've always regretted it. Ever since then, the painting has been tucked away in the English countryside. The present owner has been waiting for the right moment to try to bring a lost constable back into the light. The whole art world has moved on. We now know so much more about his techniques, his foibles, the way he put his paintings together. And we've got digital access in a way we never had before to ledgers and sales catalogues and provenance. I see this as a cold case that we need to reopen. We've come to take another look at the painting at the home of the current owner, businessman Henry Reed. Hello, Henry. Hello, Philip. Nice to How see are you? you? It's very good to see you. Hi, Henry. Nice yeah. to meet you. How do you do? Very nice to meet you. Come along in. Thank you. Here's the picture, and um, I hope you like it. That is really lovely. Well, I can see why it appeals to you, Henry. And I can see why it caught your eye, because that is one of the most famous scenes in British art. Absolutely. This is Willie Lott's cottage on the banks of the River Stour in Suffolk. This is the very same subject that Constable depicted in his most famous painting, The Haywain. The Haywain is Constable's most celebrated work. It hangs in pride of place at the National Gallery in London and is one of Britain's best-loved pictures. Born in 1776, John Constable is one of the leading lights of British landscape painting. Famed for his idyllic pictures of the English countryside, he was an innovator who captured the natural world with fresh vitality. Painted in 1821, the Haywain was the picture that made Constable's name, and I sold Henry the dream that this unattributed work 
might be an alternative view of his most famous landscape. When did you buy the picture, Henry? I bought the picture in 2000. I bought it off Philip, but I'd bought art off Philip before. I really liked the painting. I thought it was fantastic. It was a beautiful scene. It was beautifully painted, and uh, I loved it. As simple as that. How much did you pay for it from Philip? I paid 35,000, which is a lot of money. For a painting you don't know if it's genuine or not? Correct. Having said that, I had Philip's conviction behind me. So no pressure on you then, Philip? Well, I had a conviction, a dream, that it was, that it was possibly right. And, and I got you to buy into that, didn't I, really? Yeah, very much so. My history with the picture goes back to 1995, when I was an up-and-coming art dealer, trawling the sales for possible sleepers. It was described as a circle of John Constable, you know, very, very vague estimate, two to three thousand pounds. I ended up buying it for ten thousand pounds and tried to prove that it was right. And I showed it to one of the leading experts. He said no. And being a dealer, I couldn't hang on to this for a very long time because art dealers can't afford just to put money into a picture and then just hope and wait. Five years later, I had another chance to buy the painting again at double the cost, £20,000. I then tried to prove it again and failed. And that's when Henry came in to the picture. So let me just get this straight then. You sold it to Henry here for £35,000, which is quite a healthy profit margin. <laughs> now you're trying to embarrass me. Perish the thought. And yet you thought there was enough in it, Henry, even though Philip had, had tried and failed twice at this point. Certainly for me it was a bet worth taking. You could have bought a dud here. I could have bought a dud, but if it wasn't a dud, then there's significant upside. Well, what would the upside be then, Philip? If this is indeed John Constable, what would this be worth? As an authentic sketch by Constable, I could see it making in excess of two million pounds. Did you know that, Henry? No, not at all. That's an extraordinary sum. It's a very, very, very large sum if it proves to be genuine. It's been almost 20 years since I let this picture go. Did I make the right or wrong decision? Seeing this picture again, I get the same jolt of excitement, which I did when I first saw it. This looks like a constable. This has all the classic ingredients, which he's famous for, with the Hay Wayne and other pictures. I mean, you've got Willie Lott's cottage. You've got the cart crossing the river. And you've got that expressive English weather sky, the scudding clouds. My feeling is that this is Constable producing a picture heading towards the Hayway. Why not? If this painting does turn out to be Constable, it is potentially such an important work. What do you think you might do with it? I think the public has to see it. If it is deemed indeed important enough to be exhibited, obviously we have to wait until we see whether it's real. To be honest, I thought long and hard before taking this on because I could be wrong. And there were some very senior experts who disagreed with me. The constable experts who viewed the painting in the late 1990s found elements for the picture unconvincing and even crude. It had never appeared in any official inventory of constable's work and had little in the way of provenance. But with many new avenues of research open to us, I think the time is right to uncover the truth about this painting once and for all. I think Henry's picture deserves one last chance, a final big push to try and prove that it could be a lost piece of British art history. It's my theory that it's an alternative view of the scene depicted in the Hayway, so I'm heading to the place that inspired it in search of evidence. Constable Country in Suffolk. Constable grew up in the Stour Valley where his father was a prosperous corn merchant. The family's water mill at Flatford still survives, faithfully preserved by the National Trust. Constable's journey from aspiring artist to celebrated landscape painter was long and arduous. It took many years for him to be recognized. When success finally came, well into his 40s, Constable said he owed it to his careless boyhood 
and all that lies on the banks of the Stour. This was his training ground. These scenes made me a painter, he said. None more so than this idyllic view. I feel I've just walked into the most famous landscape painting of all time. I mean, the question is, why and how is it so powerful? You know, what did Constable do in order to make this so enduring, the most popular landscape, the most popular painting for many people ever done? I mean, the sky, the sky is so astonishing. It's half the picture. I mean, look at the scale of it. I mean, he really knew what clouds were. And then your eye goes down to the middle of the river, to the hay cart, to the hay wain. And in it, two people are discussing something. But one arm is then pointed outwards towards, towards Willie Lott's cottage. This wonderful sort of dwelling in the middle of the countryside, enfolded by nature and by these trees. The wonderful bush of elderflower that's in flower now and was in flower when he painted it in this picture. I mean, that is the authority of, of, of an eyewitness account. This is someone who's been here, who's grown up here. I mean, Constable said that painting is another word for feeling, and there's a sense of authenticity. It's a portrait of, of Constable himself, of his childhood, of all these things around here that he'd encountered, that he'd studied, that he'd, he'd collected with his eye. And it's amalgamated in this epic composition. And to think, Henry's picture could be part of the genesis of this great work. Constable sketched the home of tenant farmer Willie Lott from many different angles before he settled on the scene depicted in the Haywain. I'm meeting Simon Peachy from the National Trust, who's going to show me the various views so I can establish whether Henry's picture might be one of them. How about over here? Because I can see that there's a very clear view of the river. So what about the view from this angle? Well, I'm not convinced. Because the view in front of us is, I think, the one that inspired the mill stream. You can see the view matches very well Constable's painting. You've got yeah. the house there on the left, and you've got the wall on the right, and you've got the lovely view through the trees in the centre there. Well, we're in the wrong place. So whereabouts now? Round the corner? I think if we go round the corner... So it's round here. Oh, so this is, this is distinctly Willie Lott's cottage from the side. You've got the chimney breast. Except it feels as though we've gone round a little bit too far. It's, it's, it's slightly skewed from here, isn't it? I agree with you. And actually, the view that it reminds me of is this one, which ah. is the Valley Farm, 1816. Another masterpiece of Willie Lott's Cottage. Absolutely. But can we find the view that's depicted in Henry's painting? So, presumably, it could be somewhere along this wall here? Yeah. Now, actually, this angle of the architecture is much more convincing, isn't it? I think it is, because if you look at the gable end of the house, it's yeah. just in the right position, isn't it? And actually, you've got the wall as well at the right angle. I think this is it. And to top off the scene, Simon can add one of Constable's trademark touches, a flash of red. I think that completes the picture. So we've found that the view depicted in Henry's picture does indeed match up with one at Flatford Mill. But what about the provenance of Henry's picture, its previous owners? I'm looking for clues on the back of the canvas, and there's an intriguing label. Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So this would suggest that this painting was exhibited or loaned to this museum in LA as a constable and we've got a potential owner here, Mr. and Mrs. Lee Batson. Who are you? With our most promising provenance leads pointing to America, I've come to Los Angeles on the hunt for information about the last known owners of Henry's picture. I'm heading to the Getty Research Institute, which is the place to come if you need to track down the origins of a mysterious work of art. It's a fortress of knowledge. It contains extensive archives dating back to the Middle Ages. The whole place is protected against earthquake and fire, 
so that the material held here is preserved for future generations. I've asked for the help of Julia Armstrong Totten, one of the world's leading experts in provenance research. She helped create the Getty's Collector's Files, 20,000 folders of information about the world's art dealers, museums and collectors. And there's one on Lucy and Lee Batson. Right, Julia, let's have a look in this file. I'm dying to see. OK, so this is Lucy Smith Doheny Batson. Lucy was a matriarch of a very famous family here in Southern California, the Doheny family. They made their fortune in oil, and uh, her late father-in-law was one of the wealthiest men, if not the wealthiest men in America in their wow. day. And presumably very well known in LA. They were. In fact, if you drive around, you'll see Doheny Drive, you'll see Doheny Beach. And so Lucy and her husband, Ned, built this mansion in Beverly Hills called Greystone Mansion. Wow, look at that. Yeah, it's pretty spectacular, isn't it? It was considered probably the most beautiful and, and one of the largest estates built in California at the time. So this was a stupendously wealthy family Incredible. by any standards. Incredibly wealthy, incredibly wealthy. But they weren't without scandal. Uh, as you can see here, Doheny Jr. murdered, crazed secretary kills, millionaire and himself. Lucy's husband and the secretary both ended up dead. We don't really know the details today. There's, you know, a lot of questions about what actually happened. Within a couple of years, though, Lucy remarried. And she married a gentleman called Lee Batson, who was also involved in oil. And together, they formed a wonderful collection of paintings. And you can see uh, some examples here. So we've got Canaletto, Pissarro, Monet. So this is a serious art collection of the great names. Some of the greats, exactly. After Lucy died, aged 100, in uh, 1993, there was a sale, there was an auction, and this is part of what was auctioned off. Right, and is Henry's picture in this sale? No, it wasn't. Uh, hang on, just get out of my bag. Got this label here with Mr. and Mrs. Lee Batson. Right. So this would suggest that they did own it. It does, and in fact, I think this is probably uh, some kind of a loan exhibition label. So the question is, did the LA County Museum display Henry's picture as a constable, loud and proud, perhaps in an exhibition, or did they have doubts about it themselves. Back in London, I've asked Henry to dig out any new evidence he's got that might help earn the painting another hearing. In 2002, a pencil sketch depicting the same scene as Henry's picture came up for auction, so he snapped it up for nine and a half thousand pounds. It's so good to see this. It's a 100% accepted, authentic work by John Constable, and it seems to show a large proportion of the content of your painting, doesn't it? It seems to, yes. I mean, we have the horse and cart. We've got the mill stream with the reflections in it. We have a tree here in the same position. There are many, many parallels. It unquestionably relates. The only frustrating thing about this drawing is it doesn't show your complete composition. The right-hand side is missing, as it were. And what I'd love to do is take this to one of the constable experts and really get to grips with it, try and understand it further. I'm heading to the Victoria and Albert Museum, which holds an unrivaled collection of constables' works from finished paintings to preliminary sketches left in his studio after his death. My theory is that Henry's picture could be one of these sketches, a loosely painted working draft of Willie Lott's cottage. I've arranged to meet Annie Lyles, one of the world's top constable scholars. She is one of the experts that will have to convince to have any chance of proving that Henry's picture is genuine and she's well acquainted with all the known versions of Willie Lott's cottage. You know, I just love this picture. It's so wild and passionate and, and fluent. And to think this is a six foot, full sized sketch for the famous Haywain. And dare I say it, I almost prefer it. If I'm really honest, I think I prefer it because well, you see Constable's creative processes at work, but it is part of the process, and it wasn't designed to be seen in his own day. 
I feel it almost, it's like Constable having let his guard down. You, you get to know him as an artist. And you know, one of the things that excited me about Henry's picture, and which I can see here, is that sort of almost slightly though out of control quality. Yes, I mean, it seems so fresh and natural that people tend to assume that it was painted in the open air, but it wasn't. It was made in the studio, probably over a period of months between 1820 and 1821, and for it, Constable relied on material that he'd painted 10 years earlier. The seeds of the haywain can clearly be seen in a series of small sketches Constable painted while he was in Suffolk. He did paint these and think, this will become the haywain one day. He was simply note-taking. He was making sketches in the open air, because of course, by the early 20s, when he was painting the Haywain proper, he was in London in his studio, married, children, and so on. So he no longer had the scenes in front of him. So these were like his, his storehouse of images, his memories, as it were, of, of his time in, in Suffolk, which then in London he could conjure into pictures. And I can't help noticing this, the, the, the trotting sheepdog that starts in 1810 yes. and, and then bounces into the um, preparatory sketch yes. and, then, and then makes it into the final famous Haywain. I think Henry's picture could well have had its roots in Constable's storehouse of images. Several distinctive elements can also be found in genuine sketches and drawings. The two-wheeled card appears in several early sketches. One of them fits the picture exactly. The leaning figure in red. It's a motif which could be found in other early works. And most compelling, Henry's authentic pencil drawing depicting the left-hand side of his oil painting. But will Annie Lyles buy into my theory? There is clearly a direct relationship between this drawing and your painting. But from my position of having seen so many works of this type that are clever fakes, I feel I have to point out that what these clever fakers often did was to take classic constable ingredients that they knew from sketches and pictures, just like we've been discussing, and to blend them in very cleverly into a composition that looks like constable. So it might be a fakist who's doing this and got access to this drawing. You need to build more of a case, in my view. Proper technical analysis, pigments, how it was constructed, that aspect of the picture. And secondly, you need to do more research into the picture's provenance. It's clear Annie will take some convincing. Back in LA, I'm on the trail of that label, which suggests Henry's picture was once loaned to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. I'm keen to know if it was ever exhibited at this prestigious museum as a genuine constable. The Los Angeles County Museum of Art does have a file on Henry's painting. They won't allow us to film it, but they have told Julia that Henry's painting was exhibited here as a constable, not once, but twice, in 1967 and 1969. So they believed in it. But then somewhere between that time and 1995, when Philip bought it, fell off a cliff and stopped being a constable. So what we need to find out now is when did that happen and why? I'm hoping I can find out why Henry's picture appears to have been unceremoniously discredited as a work by Constable. Was there something about the painting itself that aroused suspicion? I've sent it to the Hamilton Carr Institute, a specialist art research facility in Cambridge. Sarah Cove, one of the world's leading authorities in Constable's painting techniques, has agreed to examine the painting in forensic detail. As the founder of the Constable Research Project with 30 years expertise, she's examined hundreds of genuine works by the artist, as well as countless fakes. What will she make of Henry's picture? Now, your response to this is very significant. I think it's very interesting. Um, the thing that stands out to me immediately is the colour of the ground. OK, so that's the layer beneath the paint in the background, sort of shining through like a sort of negligee through a dress. Yes, an artist would buy uh, a canvas from an artist colourman with a white ground 
and then they would potentially add another paint layer in a colour of their choice. This is what I would call mushroom pink. You can see it particularly clearly in these thin areas of the sky. And dare I ask, is it the sort of thing that you associate with, with our friend John Constable? Certainly this sort of mushroom pink shade is something that he used, but I need to have a more mm. detailed look. OK, so this is encouraging, but give it to me straight. I'm, I'm a grown-up art dealer. Is there anything in here that worries you? There is some brushwork in these trees in particular that I'm not 100% convinced by. It stands up from the surface and it almost looks as if it's been stenciled on. Right. Um, and you wouldn't normally expect to see anything like that in a work by John Constable. It doesn't seem right to me. Well, that's a bit worrying. Yes, I'm a bit concerned about that. Back in LA, I've come to the former home of the Batsons, the previous owners of Henry's painting. This is Greystone Mansion, perched high in Beverly Hills. When it was built in 1928, it was the grandest estate ever to have been constructed in the city of Los Angeles. I'm hoping to find out more about Henry's painting. Where did the Batsons acquire it? And why did it fall from grace, stripped of the name Constable? I'm meeting Lucy Batson's family, who've agreed to share what they know. Peter and Will, it's lovely to meet you here Thank at Greystone, you. in the home of your grandmother, your grandmother by marriage, Lucy Batson. Tell me a bit about her, what was she like? Well, she smoked till she was a hundred. <laughs> and drank, so. I think she was very strong woman. Very Ooh. strong. A bit scary, but very interesting. We all used to call her sweetheart, and you might wonder why that was. Most of us felt it was a huge misnomer, because <laughs> she was quite the opposite. What can you tell me about the painting? Well, I, I can tell you that we found a photograph of it hanging in their next house. That's it? Yeah. They're on the wall. It's wonderful to see Henry's picture once hanging proudly as a genuine constable. But where did it come from? So how did she buy her art? The majority of it was purchased in the, I guess, in the late 50s. And that's how, in going through Mr. Batson's diaries, that's how we found the entry, which tells us about the purchase of the painting. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is 1957. European trip. Went to see Mr. Dudley Tooth at Arthur Tooth and Sons. Now, Arthur Tooth, very well-known dealer at the time in London, very respected dealer. Bought a constable and a Monet. And so that, as far as you're aware, is the constable yes. that was hanging in that photograph. Correct. How interesting. Well, that's just brilliant. Yeah. With this reference to Arthur Tooth, which obviously we'll check out, this takes us back 10 years further into the past in terms of our knowledge about oh, the painting. Right. Okay. We've taken it back as far as 1967. Now we're back at 1957. This is an intriguing new provenance lead, which I need to investigate. But there's another mystery I'm also hoping to solve. How did the picture come to be rejected by the art world? Do you know what happened to the painting? Well, after her death, uh, all of the art world was consigned to auction. And uh, most of the paintings, Impressionist paintings, certainly were going to be sold in New York, but it was recommended that this particular picture be sold in London. And uh, upon the experts in London looking at the, at the painting, there was a strong feeling that it was not by Constable's hand, and they were going oh. to re-attribute the picture to a circle of constable. So this is the moment then when the painting ceased huh. officially to be a constable? Correct. I mean, what was the reaction in the family? What was your reaction? Well, the, the, <laughs> the reaction was, okay, so send it back. But somehow they got lost in the, uh, <laughs> in the uh, Pony Express and they sold the painting. It got sold? Yeah. Yes. So you never saw it again? Never saw it again. Wow. <laughs> 
How will you feel if we do manage to prove it's a John Constable? I think we'd probably be very happy for the current owner. We would, we would, yeah. And also prove that our grandmother was right, too. Sweetheart knew what she was doing. Yeah, exactly. I'm following this exciting new paper trail back to London. After checking the archives, I have some news for Henry. Now, Henry, take a look at this to begin with. Oh, wow, there it is. There is your picture. Unquestionably, <laughs> isn't it? Isn't that marvellous? Yeah. But moreover, Lee Batson was a prolific diary writer. Mm. And look at this name, Arthur Tooth and Sons, and he writes, bought a constable. Is the constable your constable? Yes, it is, because we checked Arthur Tooth's archives. Here we are, Willie Lott's Cottage, sold to Lee Batson, 1957. The Arthur Tooth records show that in 1957, Henry's painting was sold as a 100% authentic work by John Constable. Some 30 years later, though, the world's leading constable experts had instead concluded it was a fake, most likely the work of one of the artist's many imitators. The problem is, Henry, we've entered shark-infested waters now in the art world. Constable is one of the most faked artists of the 19th century. Look, have a look at these two pictures. Which one do you think is my constable? Ooh, how long do I have? Well, I like a challenge. What yeah. do you think, Henry? I'm going to let you decide. I would have said that one. You are correct, but look how close that other one, which is a pastiche. In yes. other words, based on this famous painting, the cornfield, but with a few motifs from yes. other pictures, yeah. like the rainbow and the, and the church. You can see how difficult it is. Yeah. OK, but have a look at these three. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of them is right, two are not. In my opinion, it's between these two. And on balance, I would go for the one on the far right. Congratulations, Henry. I salute your eye. You're right. That is the genuine constable. Oh, well done, Henry. Bit that, of luck. <laughs> well, because that one's a shocker, isn't it? The one it you is, nearly went for. But I thought that was a bad photograph. So the one in the middle is a pastiche, another one of those works based on a famous painting by Constable. And the one at the end is, in fact, nothing more than a duplicitous fake. It was published in 1905 as a real constable. The point is, though, Henry, we've entered a nightmare for us in the art world, and with any luck, forensics will pick up whether another hand has been at work with your picture. Back at the Hamilton Carr Institute, I'm hoping thorough technical analysis might provide clearer evidence of whether Henry's picture is the work of constable or a forger. Chris Titmus, a fine art imaging specialist, is using ultraviolet, infrared and X-ray photography to look through the paint layers. Oh, I feel it. Sarah Cove is going to interpret the images. What you can see here, which you can't see on the painting, is that the horses and cart have all been moved to the right over here. But underneath, there are these very sweet, tiny little brush strokes here, which would have been done with a soft-haired brush, which I suspect are the legs of a horse which is no longer visible. So we've got layers and layers as the artist is working through his thoughts and keeping on changing it. But that's fascinating. That's just the sort of thing I find so encouraging when you're trying to prove that a painting is by somebody because it's an indication of a proper artist at work. Is a faker gonna do that? So far, so good. But what about those rogue brushstrokes that Sarah was unconvinced by? We can see them very clearly here in the infrared. They're just like dabs of the end of a brush with these funny dots in a line and exactly the same here. We might find out a bit more if we look at the ultraviolet light image. And in actual fact, those dodgy brush strokes stand right out. They couldn't be clearer. They were nope. like sinister they... fingerprints. I think that there's a possibility that they might have been added by a later hand. So two artists at work rather than one. That sounds like a problem. It might be a problem or it might not. We know that after Constable's death, lots of his paintings were worked on because his children were small and they wanted to try and sell them to raise money for the family. So artist friends painted up some of the pictures, maybe added things, smartened them up, made them look a bit more finished, just to make the paintings more saleable. Well, that's both a chilling and intriguing thought. 
This kind of tampering was just the beginning. As Constable's reputation grew in the decades after his death in 1837, unscrupulous dealers began touching up unfinished works and forgers began to pollute the market. I'm genuinely really surprised to hear that there may be two hands at work in this picture. I mean, I'd spent a lot of time with it. I'd never speculated that that might be a possibility, which is, to be fair, both good news and bad news. I mean, it's good because we know that that happened to some constables after his death. It was part of the course. The sketches got built up, turned into more commercial pictures. It's bad news because if this is by constable and we can't get to it, we can't see what's beneath, then it will never get through. With Sarah's analysis raising tricky questions, I'm taking up the provenance trail. I've been trying to find out who owned the picture before it passed through the Arthur Tooth Gallery in 1957, and I'm following up a possible lead. Colnaghi is one of the oldest and most respected commercial art galleries in London. Since it was founded in the 18th century, many a masterpiece has passed through its doors, and they hold extensive records of the paintings they've bought and sold. I've asked the team here to check if Henry's picture was one of them. Now, this appears to be a catalogue, paintings by old masters. April 1954. Right, so... These are real heavyweight old masters. I mean, and Colnaghi's was famous for selling these trophy pictures. Oh, here we go, look at it. There it is. There it is, absolutely. And, and there's a catalogue entry beneath. Ah, John Constable, number 15. According to Mr. R.B. Beckett, it is an alternative design for the famous Haywain the picture may have been painted in the studio between 1817 and 1820 and not quite finished, possibly because the painter preferred another composition. Do you know, this, this is a real revelation. Yeah. Beckett was a leading constable scholar, and for him to take it under his arm, well, that's progress. But hang on a moment. It looks different. If we compare the 1954 photo to how Henry's picture looks today, the trees are much fuller, there's more foliage. It would appear that your picture had been overpainted in some mm. way. It had been enhanced. Someone had clearly tried to turn your sketch into a slightly fuller picture. And this is the evidence. But at some time afterwards, somebody has taken the overpaint off. So this was a period in which it looked like a different painting. It's clear to see that Henry's painting still bears the scars of this botched makeover. Could this have influenced the opinion of the experts who viewed it in the 1990s and deemed it a fake? We need to delve deeper into the painting's past to find out just where Colnaghi acquired it. So here we have the artist on the left here. John Constable. Willie Lott's Cottage, collection of Mrs. Smith's and Andrews, Priests Lane, Shenfield, which must be in Essex. I mean, look, that is utterly wonderful. This is a name and address of a Mrs. Smith who owned your picture before it was at Colnaghi's. It's very, very exciting. And I sort of wonder who Mrs. Smith is. I mean, she was clearly an art collector and had very good taste, in my opinion. <laughs> I'm taking up the search for the mysterious Mrs. Smith, starting with burial records at the parish church in Shenfield, where she's listed as Clarice Emma Smith. She was married to a ship's broker called Alfred Harris Smith. But where did they acquire Henry's painting? I've been scouring newspaper archives for any mention of a constable picture called Willie Lott's Cottage. I've unearthed a reference to one in a sale at Puttick and Simpson auctioneers in 1930. Could it be Henry's picture? The British Library holds an extensive collection of historic auction catalogues, and an archivist has searched out the records of Puttick and Simpson. So here's the catalogue. Puttick and Simpson, May 28th, 1930. And what's 
brilliant is we've got the auctioneer's set here. So these are the detailed notes that any auctioneer will take of the sale, who's buying, who's selling, the price that's been paid. So, Willie Lott's Cottage. Here we go, Willie Lott's Cottage. But to be sure this is Henry's picture, we need to find out who bought it. Not there. Got it. Got it. Here we go. A. H. Smith. That's got to be Alfred Harris Smith. That, the coincidence would just be too great. But who was selling it? Henry's painting, which we know was once owned by Alfred Harris Smith and Clara Smith, was before that owned by none other than the Right Honourable Lord Dewar, formerly of Savoy Court, London. And he sounds to me sufficiently grand to have owned a constable. I've been doing a bit of digging about Lord Dewar. He lived here at the Savoy until his death in 1930, and it turns out he was quite a character. I'm meeting Philip and Henry here so I can share some exciting news. Hello, Fiona. Hi there. So, of all the bars in all the world, why here? I should have known you'd come up with some terrible cheesy line, Philip. Henry, how are you doing? <laughs> Very well, thank you. The reason we're here is because I now know who owned your picture before Alfred and Clara Smith. Wow. You've got a name? I've got a name. And the reason we're here at the Savoy is because this is where he lived. He had a home in Sussex, but this was his home in London. And in fact, he was the longest serving resident here at the Savoy, living here from 1904 to 1930 when he died, when the property from his apartment, including your picture, was sold. How fascinating. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> fascinating. And before I tell you his name, I brought you a little gift, Henry. Oh. As an embodiment of his spirit. Oh, great. Uh, so it's a bottle. Oh, wow. John Dewar and Son. Dewar's white label. OK, think less John Dewar, more Son. OK. Because one of his sons was this man, Lord Thomas Dewar. Tommy Dewar, also known as Whiskey Tom. Hmm. And he was sent down here to London when he was 21. And his mission was to sell whiskey not just to London, but to the world. And he was a natural salesman, witty, extrovert, charming, went to the right parties, was friends with royalty, and he was a great success. He amassed great wealth, and with great wealth came a great art collection. Oh, great. And after he died, his estate was sold at an auction house and Willie Lott's cottage was bought for 21 guineas by Alfred Harris Smith. Smith. Ah, Smith. The link. A Smith which we discovered in Colnaghi's. It's one and the same painting, and that's your picture. Yeah, but Henry, this takes us further down the spine of the 20th century. We're now into the 30s, but we need to find out where Tommy bought his pictures from, and specifically where he bought yours. To Whiskey Tom. To Whiskey Tom. To Whiskey Tom. We're on our way to Perthshire in search of Whiskey Tom. I want to find out more about Tommy Dewar and his art collection, and crucially, where he acquired Henry's picture. We've come to Dewar's distillery in Aberfeldy to find out more. Born in 1864, Tommy is credited with making Dewar's a global success. He was one of the pioneers of modern advertising, selling his whiskey to the world in the most innovative ways. In 1898, he created one of the first motion picture ads featuring dancing Highlanders, which is screened on a New York rooftop. We're meeting whiskey expert Charles McLean, who's going to tell us more about the man who owned Henry's picture. How nice to meet you. Come and sit down. He was a most remarkable character by any standards. He was a consummate salesman, and he was one of the very first to use art in advertising. I can't help noticing around us in this room all of these images, highly familiar images of, of Scottish art. I mean, the Rayburn of McNabb. Mm. He owned that picture. You'll see beside it these images of coaching inns by Charles Maggs. 
in which he's rather cheekily put the yes, name. He, put, he, he filled in the, jo the Joe's name and, and used them in his print advertising. And I can't help noticing over your head, Monarch of the Glen. Monarch of the Glen. You know, one of the most familiar images of mm. 19th century Victorian art. Mm. Now, you're not going to tell me that Tommy owned that as well. He did indeed. He bought it in 1916. And again, incorporated it into his advertising. A strong link of companionship, both from the Glens. One is Lancia's Monarch, and the other, Dewar's. <laughs> so, the man who owned Monarch of the Glen also owned your image. Very reassuring. Well, it adds substance, doesn't it? Tommy was clearly a serious art collector who doesn't look like he'd be duped by a dud. But where did he acquire Henry's painting? Dewar's archivist Jackie Sargent has been trying to answer that question. With no clues in the company accounts, she's been looking into where Tommy bought his other pictures. So we know he had the Monarch of the Glen painting. Um, in 1916, he purchased that. Um, and I looked at who had that painting before him, and that was Thomas Barrett. He was the chairman of Pears Soap. Barrett was a pioneer of that type of advertising, using art, and then Tommy Dewar followed very much in those footsteps. So he was Tommy Dewar's mentor in many respects? I think he was. That's the impression I get. So this is an article in an art magazine in 1898 about the art collection of Thomas Barrett. And here we have Monarch of the Glen. So there we have it. And amongst the collection, he also had nine constables. Yeah. Nine constables? Yes. Well, that's incredibly exciting. Exactly. Yeah. And I'd like to draw your attention to a little excerpt here in the article that describes one of them. Another wonderful harmony of colour is a palette knife sketch for another of Constable's famous works. The watermill with Willie Lott's house. <laughs> Allowing for the effect of being viewed from a distance. The example in question is unsurpassed for its breadth, brilliant colouring, glowing harmonies, atmosphere and illusory qualities. It certainly sounds like my painting. Yeah. And palette knife as well. You know, there's highly distinctive, sort of flattened on strokes. And we've got Willie Lott's house. Yeah, yes. it's great, isn't it? Those words, if they do describe what I feel they probably do, which is your picture, we're pushing back into the 19th century. We're getting close to the life of, of John Constable himself. Yeah. Well, this is very exciting. It's a compelling theory. Tommy Dewar bought Willie Lott's cottage, Henry's painting, from friend and fellow art lover, Thomas Barrett. The question is, where did Thomas Barrett get it? I'm still trying to take all of this in, all, all of these things I've seen today. I mean, I think it's true to say, if I'd encountered a fraction of what I know now, 20 years ago, I probably would have never sold this picture. Henry wouldn't own it now. And, and all of these chapters that keep unfurling, but then there's that final chapter that we don't have, and that's to do with Constable or Constable's family. Will we find it? I hope we will. We've taken the provenance as far as we can, but before we present our case to the experts, there's one final piece of evidence I want to explore. We're heading to a studio in North London because I need the help of a fine art photographer. I've asked Andy Johnson, former head of photography at Christie's, to help me prove whether two pieces of evidence fit together. Remember the fully authenticated pencil drawing we've established relates to Henry's painting? Executed by Constable in 1809, this tiny sketch of Willie Lott's cottage depicts the left-hand part of the composition. You can see it's matching the painting quite perfectly. Wow, that's great, isn't it? When you superimpose one over the other, Constable's pencil sketch matches up with Henry's picture, but the right-hand side of the composition is missing. I think I've found that missing link. Searching through all recorded sketches by Constable, I've chanced upon another drawing of Willie Lott's cottage, dated 1816. It's held in a museum in Marseille, and they've sent me a digital image. OK, Andy, can you manoeuvre the Marseille drawing to the right of our drawing to show how they might fit? Fading. Interesting. Can you crop the Marseille drawing in the upper roof area so that we can see the other drawing beneath? Yeah. 
There it is. See what I mean? I do. It's like two bits of a jigsaw puzzle slotting together. The two drawings match all the elements in the composition perfectly. So we've got that full billowing foliage into which Willie Lott's cottage nestles. And then, I love this bit, bottom right-hand corner, mm. sharp right angle. Do you see? The parapet, OK, there's a figure on it in Henry's sketch, but that's a really distinct compositional addition. It's, it's bringing in you know, one of the very few hard edges in the picture. I believe these two pencil drawings are what Constable would have used to create Henry's picture. Just sounding a slightly sceptical note for a moment, and this is tremendously exciting, but is it possible that a faker could have seen these sketches, put them together, and created Henry's painting? Is that possible? Well, apart from being the, the characteristic killjoy that you often are in moments like this, because I reckon this is, <laughs> this is, this is great progress, um, yes, yes, I see where you're coming from, but let's just think about it. These drawings, once in Constable's studio, have been separated for over a century. One held in a museum in Marseille, the other in private ownership. The chances of them both coming together, being accessible to someone who wanted to create a, a pastiche, an amalgam that looked like Constable, I mean, the chances are so slim. Sure. With this evidence, Surely now we're in a position to take Henry's painting and what we found to the experts. I think we're as ready as we ever will be. But having failed twice in the past to convince Constable scholars this picture is genuine, have we done enough? Annie Lyles and Sarah Cove are two of the world's foremost constable experts, and it's their opinion that the art market seeks when it comes to authenticating works believed to be by John Constable. They've been reviewing all the evidence and examining the picture in detail as they weigh up their final decision. I have to admit to being unusually nervous at this point, but we have found more than I ever dared hope for. We've managed to establish the view that was painted. I mean, we've pretty well stood there. It's next to where the haywain was done. We've looked into the painting physically. We found changes of mind. Now, that's not the sort of thing you would expect from a forger. We have now discovered not one but two drawings that relate to this composition in just the sort of way that Constable worked. But with all of this evidence, I can't bear the thought that I might fail again. I think this is one of the strongest provenance trails we've ever had. Unbroken back 120 years. From the fabulously wealthy Batsons in Los Angeles, preceded by Whiskey Baron Tommy Dewar, and before that, Thomas Barrett, the Constable Collector. It's a stellar cast of owners. What we haven't managed to do, though, is take the painting back to Constable himself or to his family. So I hope it's enough. Henry is on his way to the gallery, and we're all about to discover whether his painting has been accepted as a genuine work by John Constable. Hi, Henry. Hello, Henry. Hello. Hello. So, Judgment Day. Have I been a complete fool? <laughs> Hopefully like, not. Like walking into the headmaster's office. <laughs> well, if this is accepted as a fully authentic work by John Constable, by Annie Lyles and Sarah Cove, I have no doubt that on that basis there will be collectors and museums out there who consider paying in excess of two million pounds on this painting. And you paid? 35,000. And it's not just the value, it's, it's, it's historical significance as well. It would be extraordinarily important if we could prove that this sketch went into the thinking behind one of the most famous landscapes ever painted, the Haywain. It will be hugely interesting and significant in so many ways. Not much at stake. It's the moment of truth. Annie and Sarah are ready to give their verdict. Hello. Hi, Annie and Sarah. We are on tenterhooks here. Have you reached a verdict? We have. We've reviewed all the evidence and we've come to a decision. And in our opinion, it is indeed a genuine, authentic,
compositional sketch by John Constable. Wow. <laughs> hey! Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Very good. Oh, great. Very, very wonderful news. Very good news. Bit of a relief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is very good news. I'm thrilled. I've always loved the painting, but I had the uncertainty as well. So a lost landscape by John Constable has at last been restored to its rightful place. But I've, I've got to ask you, what was it that persuaded you? I mean, I've tried twice to do that, admittedly a long time ago, but what did it this time? I thought if it was by Constable, it would be around about 1820. And absolutely everything is there that you would expect to find in a Constable of that date. We know that at some point it was overpainted, but most of that's been removed now. And the small bits that are left don't affect the attribution at all. What persuaded you, Annie? One of the most important things in relation to persuading me finally was those related sketches. But also, the provenance chain is so convincing. You go backwards in time to Thomas Barrett, and actually I have an extra piece of evidence for you. I've discovered in a sale catalogue, Christie's 1874, that one Barrett, and I think we can assume very safely that that's Thomas Barrett, bought a constable submitted for sale by Lionel Constable, Constable's son, described as a sketch for the Valley Farm, which, in my opinion, is almost sure to be this. Wow. What would you make of that, Henry? That's, that's incredible. That's fantastic. fantastic. It, it's very rare to find it so neatly going all the way back in that unbroken chain. Knowing what we know now then, yes. how important would you say this painting is? It's very important indeed. I, I'm staggered. It's fabulous. <laughs> so what will you do with this painting now, Henry? Well, it needs to be displayed. So the public can enjoy it as well? Absolutely. What a brilliant result. I mean, how often does that happen, that we're able to take a painting all the way back to the brush of the artist himself. And you must feel vindicated. Well, perhaps I wasn't deluded after all. I mean, it began to feel like that. I'm so thrilled for Henry, but also for John Constable. We've added another painting to the canon of one of the best loved landscape painters of all time. If you think you have an undiscovered masterpiece or other precious object, contact us at bbc.co.uk slash fake or fortune.